radicals. Okay, so if I give you square root of 72, not a perfect square, do you guys remember how to break that down? Like, what do you do if you have something under a square root? Do you guys do, say that again? Find it, like, okay, do you guys like factor tree or biggest perfect square or how do we do it? I like calculated. The calculator's not going to do it. It's going to give me a decimal. So if I have to break it down, do you do factor tree? What do you do? I, uh, to find factors? Yeah. Um, I just try dividing by two, dividing by three, dividing by four. Okay. Yeah, you can divide by anything. So let's <coughs> let's say we divide it by two, right? Like, or I don't know. If you guys look at 72, tell me two factors you think of. Two and 36. Okay. Now, you don't have to break it down by twos. What you're looking for here, if you're breaking down a square root as partners, tell me two numbers that you think multiply to give you 36. Six and six. Okay, now, you don't have, I know you can break six down farther, but if you're breaking down a square root, you're looking for a pair. So if I have a pair right there, I'm totally just done with this problem. We broke down the 72, we broke down the 36. This is a pair. If you have a pair, you pull that number out in front, and anybody that did not have a partner, which this two did not, they have to stay under the square root because they didn't have anybody to come outside with them. So this would be simplified just six radical two. That's all you have to do. You're just looking for a pair. So try to think about that. You don't have to formally do factor tree by prime numbers or whatever, just trying to find a pair. So if you can find a pair, then use the pair, and then you're done. What about this question? So I have the square root of 320 divided by the square root of four. Does anybody know what I should do first? Square root of four should be two. But I would hold off on that on one for one second. Because then we'd have to do the square root of 320. Do you guys know this? Let me just write this real quick. If you have two separate things, right? They're both under a square root. You can look at this problem as the whole thing under a square root. So like 320 over four, I would tell you to do that first. Just see if you can divide that because it might totally cancel the fraction out. So I'm just literally on my calculator, I'm doing 320 divided by four. So that gave me a nice number, that gave me 80. So really this is equivalent to the square root of 80. So I don't even have a fraction to break down. Can you guys think of a couple numbers that multiply give you 80? Two and uh, 40. Two and 40. Okay, tell me two numbers that multiply to give you 40. Eight and five. Eight and five. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be perfect. We got eight and five. Okay, now five doesn't break down any farther, right? It's only factors are one and five. So we broke down the 80, we broke down the 40. Can you guys think of two numbers that multiply to give you eight? One and four. No, four and two. Four and two. Okay. Now, two doesn't break down any further. Can I break down four any further? Yes. Okay. Now, this one is kind of weird. So I've broken all of these down. You're looking for pairs. So I actually have two different pairs of, there's a set of twos here. And then you also have a separate set of twos. Now, if I have two pairs of two, what would you pull out in front of the radical? Two. Two squared. Yes, it's two times two. Yes, two squared because you're, you're, you're taking both of these out. So it's two and another two. If you pull out two, uh, more than one pair, you multiply the numbers together. So do two times two. So you'd pull a four out in front. Now, I was breaking all of this down. The five did not have a partner. So the five would stay under the square root. That would be my answer. Which makes no sense to me. Did you do it a different way? Did oh. you find the, the way I learned how to do it was to find the biggest perfect square. So like the way I learned biggest perfect square that goes into 80 is 16. So I would rewrite that as 16 times 5. And then I know the square root of 16 is 4. The 5 stays underneath. That's how I learned how to do it. Do you know the perfect? You'd have to know the perfect squares, though. So um, like 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. They got 25, 36, 
49. Let's see, 8 would be 64, 9, 81. 10 is 100. The way I learned how to do this, I did not do a factor tree. I would find the biggest number on this list that would divide into the number. So like I was saying just now, 80. Biggest number on this list that divides into 80 is 16. So I just rewrite it 16 times 5, and then I know the square root of 16 is 4. So I never, I never learned how to do this using a factor tree. So if you want to do that, I'll write those perfect squares up on the board if you want to break it down in that format, if that's easier for you. The two next to this are not anything we're going to have to break down. What we're going to do with this, and this is going to become really important in our next lesson, this skill, is you're not allowed to have a radical in the denominator of a fraction. So I have 20 over the square root of 2. The 20 is not under a square root, so we don't want to divide like we did here where they were both under a square root. Does anybody remember the process to how to get rid of a square root in a denominator? from algebra. It's called rationalizing the denominator. Do you guys remember doing that to cancel out? Okay, see if this sounds familiar to you. Okay, whatever is in the bottom is the square root of 2, right? You're going to multiply this expression by 1, but it's going to look really weird. Just copy whatever that is. So that's the square root of 2. So I'm going to multiply it by itself. The thing is, I have to do the same thing to the top because what I'm doing there, if I do square root of 2 divided by square root of 2, that's really just multiplying by 1 because anything divided by itself is 1. What I do when I multiply this, though, it will get rid of the radical in the denominator, and I'll explain to you why. So if I just multiply straight across the top, you don't need a common denominator here, you would have 20 times the square root of 2, and then the bottom would be square root of 2 times square root of 2, you multiply the numbers together, be square root of 4. That should create a perfect square, which will cancel out um, the radical, which is the entire goal there. Does anybody know square root of 4? 2. Okay, so really, this is 20 radical 2 over 2. Now, it depends on the question. Sometimes you can do something with this, sometimes not. Don't touch the radical. I'm just going to ask you a question. Can I divide 20 by 2? Yes. Okay, so you're allowed to do that, but don't touch the radical. So 20 divided by 2 is 10, and you just put the square root next to it. So that would be simplified. So we don't have a radical in the numerator, or in the denominator. You're not allowed to have a radical in the numerator. Or in the denominator. I just said that twice. No radical in the denominator. So now I don't. I don't even have a fraction anymore. This is the same concept. It's just a hair different. They're both under a square root. 11 over 3 doesn't reduce. All you're going to do is you're going to multiply this, whatever's in the bottom. Just copy whatever's in the bottom, just square root of 3, multiply that on the top and the bottom. Okay, the difference here on the top, because the 11 and the 3 are both under square root, we're just going to squish those together, just multiply. 11 times 3 is 33. If you understand this, you can skip this step and just go to the answer, but I'm going to write this out. So 3 times 3 under a square root would be square root of 9. Your entire goal there is to take the square root out of the denominator, and if you multiply a radical by itself, it creates a perfect square. What's the square root of 9? 3. So the bottom of this is just 3. And then please, I know these can be really tricky. You can't simplify this any further. Usually whatever's under the square root will be divisible by the number that's in the denominator, but you can't do it. You can't like change this to 11 or anything like that because the top is under a square root and the bottom is not. So some of these will look kind of weird as you go through. That's your answer though. Square root of 33 over 3. Now, number five here is super similar to number two. It's just going to be a little different because the denominator's bigger. But you can also look at this as square root of 8 over 24. Can I reduce 8 over 24 as a fraction? Yes. Okay, what would it be? 8 times 4. No, 8, eight times 4. 8 times 3. Okay, there you go. They're both divisible by 8. So if you divide both of these by 8, this is really the same as the square root of 1 third. And you can do that on your calculator too. You guys know that, right? So if you have, I don't know if this is going to show up very well, if you guys can see this. Your, if you have this calculator, your ABC key, if you do 8, that ABC key, it's right, the third button down, 
in that second column, just do 8 over 24 like that, and it'll reduce it for you. Just hit equals. Anyway, now we didn't take a square root, we just reduced the fraction. So this is actually super similar to the question we just did. I got to rationalize that denominator. So I'm just going to do top and bottom by the square root of 3. You'll see that kind of come up a lot because we'll use this in our next lesson, the square root of 3s in a lot of the questions. Across the top, you would just have 1 times the square root of, or square root of 1 times square root of 3, which would be square root of 3. The bottom would be the square root of 9. However, the entire purpose of doing this is to cancel out the radical in the bottom, so the bottom should be a perfect square. Square root of 9, we just did that in the last question, was 3. Okay, do you guys know how to multiply radicals? So my next question has 2 radical 5 times 3 radical 10. Do you know how that works to multiply those? Would you just take both the common denominators or whatever and then times them? So find the perfect square of both of them and then times them? Mm. I, don't, I think you're on the right track. Like, okay, so if I have two roots of five, three roots of ten, what do you do with the two and the three on the outside? You just multiply it. Okay, so you're just gonna the numbers on the outside you just multiply together. So two times three is six. Okay, then I have a five under a square root and a ten under the square root. What do I do with those two numbers? You also multiply those. So just numbers on the outside get multiplied, numbers on the inside get multiplied. So five times ten is fifty. And then I would just try to break down fifty. So if you guys like a factor tree, use a factor tree. If you want to try this, I think this is easy too. Um What's the biggest perfect square? If I look at the list of perfect squares, can you tell me a perfect square that would divide into 50? 22. It's tw 25. 25, right? Okay, What 25 times what is 50? 25 times 2. Exactly. So I'm going to rewrite this just real quick. 25 times 2. I'm just picking a perfect square. What's the square root of 25? 5 times 5. There you go. So you can pull a 5 out right there. If something's already out in front, we have the 6 out in front. If you pull something else out, just multiply them together. So 6 times 5, 30, and then the 2 stays under the square root. If that's faster, you guys, I can write you a list of those perfect squares. That's how I learned how to do it. Now, this one I actually really just want to show you guys. I'm going to show you this by hand, but the radical will cancel out here. If you square something, it means you multiply it by itself, right? So this is 9 roots of 6 times 9 roots of 6. What's 9 times 9? 81. 81. Okay, so that would go out in front. This is really similar to the question we just did. It's just that the two things we're multiplying are exactly the same. Okay, under the square root, what's 6 times 6? 36. Okay, so then do we know square root of 36? 6. All right, this actually will totally, there won't be a radical in this question. This will totally cancel out, and I don't know what 81 times 6 is off the top of my head, so I'm going to do that on the calculator real quick. Okay, so I got 486. Now, I will tell you, if you ever have a question like that that's being squared, the radical will cancel out. You can actually do this on your calculator, too. If you want to just use the little parentheses keys, like if I do parentheses 9, and then I'm going to do the square root. If you can see my fingers, I'm going to do second. And then to get my square root is that little x squared button. It's the second function there. Put the 6. Do like two little closed parentheses. And you square it on the outside. And the calculator will do that for you. But all the radicals will cancel out in that situation if you're squaring something where you have a square root. Okay. And then let's not worry about this last one for the moment. We're just going to practice those properties today. Is anybody having a question about any of the radical properties we did? Okay, this is really going to set us up for our next lesson in combination with what I'm going to show you right now. So, Pythagorean theorem, we've talked about that multiple times. We're going to talk about the converse to the Pythagorean theorem today real quick. So, this just tells you if you've got a right triangle, the legs are A and B, the hypotenuse is C, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You guys know that. What we're going to talk about real quick is the converse. Anytime you do the converse of something, it literally just flips it over. So this says if you have a right triangle, you have these legs labeled, you have the hypotenuse labeled, then a squared plus b squared equals c squared. 
the converse just reverses that. It's going to say if a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And we're going to go ahead and assume we have legs that are labeled a and b and a hypotenuse labeled c, bless you, just so we don't have to write all that out. But if you can show the two legs, the sum of the legs squared is the hypotenuse squared, then you have a right triangle. So if you don't have a, a right angle labeled in the picture, you can, if you can show it fits the Pythagorean theorem, prove that you have a right triangle. So it just works backwards from that. Now, a Pythagorean triple, this is a special case. Um, this is a right triangle where the legs and the hypotenuse are integers. So basically they're nice numbers. Most common probably that you might see would be like a 3, 4, 5. So like 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. There's a bunch of different ones. Maybe another one that's common. Um, I'm just trying to think. Like 5, 12, 13. That's a common one. If you do 5 squared plus 12 squared that equals 13 squared. It just means all the sides of the triangle are nice numbers if it's a Pythagorean triple. A lot of the times that doesn't happen. You guys would see we'd have radicals and stuff like that when we did Pythagorean theorem. But if you have a Pythagorean triple, it just means all the sides are nice numbers. So if I want to see if this is a right triangle, the first thing you'd have to do, we would set up like a Pythagorean theorem. We're going to ask this question. You'd have to figure out which side would be the hypotenuse. So if I gave you this picture, I've got 84, 13, and 85. Which side would have to be the hypotenuse? 85. The 85, because it's the longest. Okay, so it doesn't matter the order. The other two would be the legs. Okay, so we're going to see if this is a right triangle. So 13 squared and 84 squared, those would be the two legs. And I'm going to kind of put like a little question mark here. I'm going to see if this is equal to 85 squared. If it is, then this would be a right triangle. If it's not, then it's not. Okay, so all I'm going to do on my calculator, I'm just going to do this real quick. Do 13 squared plus 84 squared. So that is 7,225. And I'm seeing if this is equal to, that's a little question mark, 85 squared. And you guys can see that it is 7,225. So these match, so my answer to this question would just be yes, done with the problem. That is a right triangle and it's a Pythagorean triple because all the sides are nice numbers. Asking you the same thing here just to check, is this a right triangle? If this is a right triangle, let me back up to this, the right angle would go across from the hypotenuse, so it would be between the 13 and the 84 there. Now, if I look at this triangle, we're going to see if this is a right triangle. Which side, I've got 4, 6, and 7. Which side would have to be the hypotenuse? Seven. The 7, the longest side. So in any order for the other two, we're going to say, okay, is, whoops, I can't write. Is 4 squared plus 6 squared? I'm questioning whether this is equal to 7 squared. Okay, I know off the top of my head 7 squared is 49. Let me try the other side. So 4 squared is 16 plus 6 squared is 36. And I just added those guys up. It's close, but this is 52. So if these are not equal, then it's not a right triangle. And then we're going to talk about on the back what kind of triangle it would be. Is anybody having a question? Okay, let me flip this over. Okay, so if it's a right triangle, that's one option. The other two options are on the back here. And we're just going to go through these real quick. So I have a little picture of each one. What you have for an acute triangle, all the angles are acute. What do I have? Do you guys remember what it have to be if I'm an acute angle? Okay, all angles are, I'm going to say, less than 90 degrees. All right, all three angles. Now, if you have an obtuse triangle, does anybody remember what an obtuse angle is? Like, what does that mean? greater than 90. Okay, now, this all if you're acute, all your angles have to be under 90. If you're obtuse, you just have one angle that's greater than 90. You only have to have one. 
And then if you have a right triangle, that's just when one angle equals 90. Okay, so I'm going to kind of do a riff on the Pythagorean theorem here. So if you have a right triangle, that's the last one. A squared plus B squared will be equal to C squared. Okay, if you have an acute triangle, A squared plus B squared will be greater than C squared. If you have an obtuse triangle, a squared plus b squared will be less than c squared. So in the case, to help me remember these, if I have an acute triangle, the what this says, the hypotenuse would be the c, right? If you have an acute triangle, the hypotenuse is smaller than the sum of the squares of the legs. If you have an obtuse triangle, the hypotenuse squared is bigger than the sum of the squares of the legs. And then if it's equal, then you have a right triangle. So I just base it on the hypotenuse. If the hypotenuse is, if that squared is smaller than the other two squared and combined, then you're going to have acute. If the hypotenuse is bigger than the other two squared and combined, then you're going to have an obtuse. So we're just going to check these out on these numbers. We're just going to grab them. Okay. Now, the deal is you have to decide which one's the hypotenuse. Guys, we don't have our phones out on a Friday because we wouldn't want to lose them over the weekend. Um, which one of these 6, 11, or 14 is going to be my hypotenuse? Okay, so all you're going to do is set up a Pythagorean theorem. So I'm going to do 6 squared, 11 squared, 14 squared. We're going to see how these are related. So the two smaller numbers oops, get squared and added together. So if we just do 6 squared, 11 squared, whoa. 36 and 121. This is 157. Okay, 14 squared is 196. Which number is bigger? 96. Okay, the 196. Now, if the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse squared was bigger, that means that this is an obtuse triangle. Okay, which 12, 13, or 5 is going to be the hypotenuse? 13. 13. Okay, so we're going to do 5 squared, 12 squared, and see how that's related to 13 squared. So if you just grab your calculator, 5 squared plus 12 squared, this is 169. 13 squared, also 169. So if they are equal, what kind of triangle do we have? Right. This is right. All right, 7, 8, 9, which one would have to be the hypotenuse? Nine. The 9, the biggest number. So we're going to do 7 squared plus 8 squared. We'll see how that's related to 9 squared. So I know 9 squared is 81. I think you guys probably know that too. So 7 squared is 49 plus 8 squared, which is 64. This is 113. Okay, is the hypotenuse squared bigger or smaller here? If that's smaller, what kind of triangle do I have? A Q. That's all you have to do. Now these last couple, and you can do this whole thing in the calculator, but it's a little weird, I think, if they give you the side as a radical, because I look at square root of 11 and I don't necessarily know what that means. So if you're not sure, because I got to figure out which side is the longest to pick which one's the hypotenuse, I'm just going to do square root of 11 real quick. And I'm just going to write a couple, I'm just, this is like a close to 3.3, just so I can compare them. And I'm going to do square root of 17 which is about 4.1. It's not a nice number, but I got to figure out kind of which, which we got to figure out which one's the longest so we can figure out which one to use as the hypotenuse. So which number out of those three should be the hypotenuse? 4.1. Right. The five. Oh, I know. I'm so mean. There's a five in the middle. No. The five would be the longest side. I know it's super mean. Okay. Now here's how you do this. This is actually easy to do in the calculator. So these two the square root of 11 and the square root of 17. Those would be the two legs. We're going to see how that's related to 5 squared. Now, what is the, if I do the square root of 11 squared, what's going to happen there? Cancels. Yeah, this literally just becomes 11. This becomes 17. Now, 5 squared is 25. So then what I have here, this would be 28 and the hypotenuse squared would be 25. So is the hypotenuse bigger or smaller? 
smaller. It's smaller. So that 25 is less than 28. So if the hypotenuse is smaller, what kind of triangle do we have? This has to be a Q. All right. Now this last one is a little weird. So that middle side length is 2 radical 55. So again, I don't know what that is off the top of my head. So I'm just typing this in my calculator to kind of look at the decimal so I can compare them. So 2 radical 55, this is like 14.8. So which one of the sides would have to be the hypotenuse in that list? Seven. The 17. Perfect. All right, so we're just going to take 6 squared. Now, I'll show you how to type this in your calculator, but this 2 roots of 55, we're going to square that. We're going to see how that's related to the 17 squared. Now, um, 6 squared, this is 36. If you guys are, here, let me grab this calculator because I think you guys have this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all you're going to do, you're going to put a little parenthesis, and the calculator will do the whole thing for you. Two, and then do your square root key for your 55, and you're just going to do two parentheses. So I'm saying, okay, I want that whole thing all in parentheses together, and then you just put the squared on the outside. And if anybody needs help with that, I will be happy to help you with that. This will become 220. Uh, let me think about that for a second. I'm going to add that that up 220 plus 236 is 256 and I know 17 squared is 289 so is my hypotenuse bigger or smaller here Small. my hypotenuse is the 289 if I square that this is bigger okay so if the hypotenuse is bigger what kind of triangle do we have this was obtuse and if anybody needs help doing that little trick on the calculator, I will be happy to show you. Or if you have a different calculator than what I just showed. Okay, now I'm going to kind of tie this back into area just a little bit before we leave today. So this is a triangle. Does anybody remember from yesterday? I'm throwing things all over the place. How do I find the area of a triangle? Just the formula in general. Wait, say it one more time. Base times height, what did you say? What am I forgetting if I just do base times height? Divide by two. Divide by two. Okay, so either one of these, don't forget the two if you're working with the triangle. Oh, shoot, you guys, I'm sorry. Um, I forgot we have a short class today. All you're going to do here if we were to do this, the 20 gets split into two equal pieces, and we'd use the Pythagorean theorem to find the height. We'll just finish that up on Monday. I'm really sorry about that.